Hi everyone, my name is Christine. Welcome to our farm. Today I'm standing in my kitchen in front of our fodder system. This is a waterfall hydroponic growing system that my husband built for us and I have in my hand a tray of wheatgrass. This is fodder which I'm growing for our livestock and um, we are doing this without soil. We're growing it with only water and seed which is a hydroponic system. So I can't wait to show you what this is and how it works. So this right here is about seven days of growth of wheat berries. So on day one of this fodder system, I soak wheat berries in water for about 24 hours. After that, they get put into a tray where um, there are drainage holes at the bottom of them. We did make our own drainage holes in these. I put a weight on top of it and that simulates soil being on top of the seed, which helps to speed up germination. After that, they get put into one of these rows here and um, every day they get moved down. So some of them are facing this way and some of them are facing this way, depending on uh, where it is in the um, hydroponic system. And that lets water drain at this end or drain at this end. And alternating it stops it from um, growing any type of like um, mildew in it. Definitely don't want mildew to be fed to my animals. So um, stay tuned because now that this is fully grown wheatgrass right here. I'm going to go feed it to the chickens and see how they enjoy it. I'm really excited to see their reaction to it. But let me give you a close up on this uh, fodder system. So this is not actually where I want this fodder system to stay, but as I was learning it and getting used to um, getting in the habit of watering it several times a day, I needed it where it would be within my sight because for me, out of sight, out of mind, object permanence is uh, something I struggle with. <laughs> So if I see it, I'm definitely going to remember it. Um, so while I'm getting in the habit of getting used to this fodder system, it needs to stay in the kitchen. Um, but this first tray up here is where the water goes in. So I water from the top and there are holes that we drilled into each tray on both sides. We did drill very carefully um, so that we would not crack them. Um, these are really heavy duty trays from Bootstrap Farmer. I highly recommend them. Um, they do have a very long warranty to them and they can hold a ton of weight. So as these um, fill up with water and then slowly drain, I do need something that is quite uh, sturdy and can handle all that water. Um, so the water basically falls from here and goes into the next tray, which falls into the next tray. And because of the way it cascades back and forth, um, everything gets an adequate watering. And I have not run into any problems of these wheat berries drying out, which is just fantastic. Now I want to show you what it looks like on day one of growth and day two and day three and day four and day five and day six and day seven, it gets pulled out and the animals get to eat it. So that was a little look at the fodder system. And next, I just want to show you where I plan to grow out a lot of our seedlings. Um, it's a little early to start all of our seedlings, but there's a few perennials that I'm going to start now. And one of those is Rudbeckia. This is the Sahara mix of the black eyed seasons. Um, so I have some other trays from Bootstrap Farmer that have domes on them and that helps to hold in moisture and stop seedlings from drying out too quickly. Um, and this is where I'm gonna grow them out in our sunroom. And I have it on a germination mat, which warms up the um, soil a little bit and helps to give the impression that spring is already here and they have domes on them to keep the moisture in. So right here behind me in this Bootstrap Farmer, um, container is Rudbeckia. Um, some people know it as Black Eyed Susans, but this is a Sahara mix. And so it's um, more than just a bright yellow flower. It's kind of a mix of colors. I'm very excited, hoping that these germinate well. Some of the other seedlings that I'll be starting soon are milkweed, another perennial. I do plan on having a very large um, pollinator garden. I they really enjoy butterflies and hummingbirds and bees and the birds. And so I plan on growing out lots of um, seedlings um, to install a very large pollinator garden. And I think I'm going to place it somewhere uh, around this area. This is our homeschool room. Can you tell it's a mess? Um, so that I can see it from these beautiful picture windows that we have in this room. One of the other ways that we're planning for crops on our farm is by preparing sweet potato slips. So I have a whole bunch of organic sweet potatoes and I have a lot of mason jars. I have been hoarding these for a while and I'm very glad that I did. 
what I'm going to do is root sweet potatoes into these mason jars um, using a couple of skewers to hold them in here so that they're not completely submerged. And what's gonna happen is little green shoots are gonna grow out of the top of the sweet potato. Obviously, this is the part that you want in the water. And then the slips that grow above the sweet potato, I'm gonna take them off, root them in a little bit more water, and then I'm going to transplant them. And the goal with these sweet potatoes is not only to give us sweet potatoes, but their leaves that grow up are a great source of compost to the garden. So this is not only gonna be a sweet potato harvest this summer, but um, I am gonna grow our own compost with the chop and drop method. So what I'm gonna do is when these are ready to be harvested, I'm gonna chop down their leafy greens, which you can eat incidentally. This is an amazing survival plant. If you're into survival homesteading, which I'm, I'm dangerously close to. <laughs> My daughter and I have a lot of talks about the zombie apocalypse because we think it's fun to plan ahead for survival. <laughs> but um, this is a great plant because it not only works as a cover crop that you can chop and drop, um, but you can eat the sweet potatoes as well. So that is one of the things that we're doing to get ready. And um, this is a great homeschool experiment. Um, if you have young children and they really want to be involved with planting, you know, sometimes having children out in the garden can actually be a hindrance to your growing because they can be a little bit rough, but it's hard to mess this up. And so letting them watch the growing cycle this way is quite fun. So I encourage you to let your kids be prepared with you with your sweet potatoes and your mason jars. Now I wanna take you outside and talk about the pollinator part of the garden and uh, show you how I'm preparing that section of the land out there by utilizing our manure from the um, animals. Okay, I'm walking outside to find three of my children in the field with shovels, there's already a hole. And there is a dead Christmas tree. I think I know what they're trying to do. Bless my soul, it's a mess out here. You're experimenting in the pasture. I think I need to have a few more science lessons with my kids out here who think that they're going to revive this dead Christmas tree. It's also a Douglas fir, which is not hardy in our zone. So even if they could bring it back to life, the summer would like kill it. I'm going to let them have their fun and they're, then they're gonna fill that hole back in. <laughs> okay, well, as long as I'm here, say hi to the donkeys. Aren't they so sweet? All right, right here behind me, I've got a mess of manure. So every time we clean out the pasture and the stalls, we are actually coming right here and we are dumping the manure. Oh, it's hard to do this backwards. There's the line. No, you may not use my biotone. At least they're learning that correctly. Guys, it's dead. It's not coming back. She's got spunk. She's got spirit. She is enthusiastically incorrect. <laughs> anyway, um, right here in front of this part, let me walk out to give you a bigger perspective so you can see this field. Um, I have planned for this area some very... <laughs> kids are amazing. Anyway, in front of this pasture right here, I've got a good, oh, eight feet of grass growing. I want to add about, about a three foot bed in front of this. I want low growing perennials. I might throw some annuals in the tube. Man, I'm a sucker for the annuals. But what I want right here is to be able to bring in um, wildlife that we can see from the front porch. There's my front porch right there. And so I want to be able to see from right here. Um, I love looking at my animals, so I want to see my animals, but you know what I don't want to see? Their manure. So we clean out the pasture at least every other day, but you know there's still going to be manure piles every once in a while. So <laughs> um, my plan is to beautify this area with some low-growing um, pollinator attractors. I'm very distracted. 
by this tree in front of me. But anyway, in this bed, I plan to have some salvias and some milkweed as well as um, sir, some verbena. Um, and over there, do you see that really gross area right there? That manure has been there for a good long time, decomposing. Um, there are leaves and some shredded paper in there as well to help um, just add to the decompo decomposition uh, process. And it has some compost starter in there from Espoma. And um, that has been sitting there long enough that that is gonna be ready to plant in. And what's going down there is my rose garden. I have some beautiful roses called the Atlas Rose. And um, I brought them with us from our last home. They were very sentimental to me. So I brought them with us and they are going right there. And everything that I'm planting in this area has to be deer resistant. We live right on the creek. This whole field of field, this whole row of trees behind me, that's where our creek is. And um, the deer just love it down there. We go down and look at their deer prints all the time. And so I know that we have a high traffic of deer over here. So I'm going to plant things that are known to be deer resistant. And um, that's how I'm going to try to, to conquer that problem. But um, that's my plan for this area right here. Then we have, uh, um, we have a lot of land behind us. Most of our land is, is that windy? I'm sorry, did that blow out your ears? I'm sorry. Um, most of our land goes out behind this barn. So I have planned for up here, a large sunflower sealed. <laughs> Words are hard a large sunflower field. And then um, behind the barn is gonna be a pumpkin patch. And I'm very excited about a pumpkin patch. I'm nervous too, because deer love pumpkin. And so I gotta be careful um, with uh, maintaining some deer resistant plants around them. We don't have plans to fence it right now because that's, a, that's an expensive fencing job. It's gonna be at about a half an acre of pumpkins. And so that's a, that's a big fence. And right now I need fence for these goobers in the field right there. Also those goobers. <laughs> but um, anyway, those are our plans um, right now. I do have some um, plants that we brought with us from our old house that are still in their pots. I should have planted them in the fall. I didn't because life is hard. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna be finding all kinds of fun places for those. Eventually, in the long term, I want a picket fence to go right here in front of our beautiful maple trees and I want limelight hydrangeas in front of them. Oh, you guys, you can support me in this. Leave a comment and be like, Scott, Christine needs her, her row of hydrangeas. That's, it's one of my favorite hydrangeas. They were the first shrub I ever purchased when we became homeowners four years ago after we moved back to the US from overseas. And so they have a soft spot in my heart. So um, yeah, y'all can be, uh, let's gang up Scott on Scott together and be like, she needs the picket fence and the hydrangeas. It'll be wedding-tastic. Oh yeah, that's another thing. I wanna have weddings out here. I gotta convince the husband on that one. All right, well, that is what our um, plans are for this spring and summer. I'm sure it'll evolve um, as new ideas come and go. Right now, I have to go in my field and give these kids some really bad news. <laughs> if you're wondering, our trees are in here because goats love to eat Christmas trees. And so we had two Christmas trees in the house and I put them in the field for the goats to eat. They ate a little bit of it, but not the whole thing. They are definitely dead and they're not coming back. So um, you guys are gonna wanna watch me break their hearts. <laughs> All right, so tell me why you think that these are gonna live. That's a, an excellent hole. I'm very impressed with your gardening skills. But hi, baby goats. Why we can't eat a Christmas tree? That's a very bad question. They already ate, look, the whole top of it. All the leaves are gone. Don't care. Helen, tell me you. They'll grow back. Helen. Stop it. Wow. Yeah. Right. Your, your milk is getting you full. This place right. You want one? We can do it. We can do it. But hold on. Okay, t tell me why you think this tree is going to live. It, it doesn't have any roots. But it will grow some roots. All right, is, the, is it possible? Yes. yes. We just need to give it lots of water, lots of sunlight, and lots of um, biotone. Well, Judd, I think you have been listening well to Miss Jenny's videos, huh? <laughs> oh, and we need, um, and we need, like, hmm, what else? Well, um, how are you going to get it to root, though? Yes, but but how does it make photosynthesis if it's already dead? Are we gonna like? How are you gonna resurrect these? 
We could. Excuse me, Helen. Helen, Helen. It's a science experiment, kind of. It's a science experiment? I love the way you think. Well, thanks for tuning in. Be sure that you stay tuned for all the fun spring growing that we will be doing here. We've got a lot of land to fill um, with plants and uh, I am very excited about the summer. I live for summer. That's all. I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>